for the kiddos. Uh, all those kindergarten to fifth grade can make their way next door. We have something very special for you this morning. And uh, I want to take a, an opportunity this morning. I'm going to share a little bit of the word. Uh, won't go too long, I hope. But we're glad to have uh, you all here. But it's interesting because we talk the idea of, of those who serve as first responders and, and those who serve in, in the military. Uh, it really becomes a, it, it's, it's one of those things, it's not a job, it's who you are. Right? It becomes a mentality, it becomes a lifestyle. I remember a gentleman who uh, walked into uh, working with the ambulance and he uh, ended up getting his EMT license and talked about sleeping with the radio right next to the bed, waiting for the call. And, uh, and his wife, I know, got slightly jealous, actually named his radio Susie. And so Susie called. He would jump and run out the door. And uh, she goes, I wish I had the power that Susie had. And, uh, and I don't know, just because he, he was new, but uh, they went on vacation, and he brought his radio down. And she's like, you're not even in the state that you're supposed to be doing that. And he would still listen for the calls. I have a friend of mine who, a uh, lifetime military man, Anytime you go somewhere, uh, he sits so his back is never at the door, right? How many guys know, anyone do that still? We're in trouble here, right? I mean, he's a little nervous, a little twitchy because the doors are in back, but always wants to, and it's just ingrained. I have another, I'm sorry? Take off, <laughs> you know, um, I was walking down the street with a gentleman who was a police officer. And this is Bangor. You know, walking down Main Street, Bangor. And uh, I think we just had gone with the Indian food there. We were walking down to the car. So just, I don't know, walking down just a block or so to the vehicle. We got in the car. And he leaned over and goes, did you see that? See what? He goes, well, the people across the street over tucked in there, they were dealing with some drugs. He goes, the guy that walked by us, he had a gun. And, uh, and there was one other thing, I can't remember what it was. He goes, you didn't see that? And I was like, no. Uh, you know, totally oblivious. But he's just so tuned to it. And I asked him, I said, can you turn that off? And he goes, <laughs> right? Yeah, some of you guys have been down this road, right? It, it doesn't turn off. Always on alert. I'm like, because I'm just blissfully ignorant. I, right? If you go to my house right now, my keys are in the car. I'm just letting you know. Oh, you know, don't lock the doors. My brother came to visit, and uh, he, he's a, a special agent. And he came to visit us, and we left, I took him out to lunch, we came back to the house, and my door was locked. He goes, oh, no, I locked it on the way out. I said, I don't know where my house key is. <laughs> I, you know, at that point, we're living in Enfield. Does anyone know where Enfield is? The, yeah, the, you know, I mean, it's, you know, and I told him my keys are in the car, and he almost had a heart attack. I said, well, no problem, I'll just go around. I have a window that's kind of loose. I'll just pop that open and crawl in the window. He goes, uh, I locked all the windows, too. I'm like, I didn't know they locked. I didn't even know my windows could all lock. Well, he goes, well, the one upstairs, he goes, that one wouldn't lock, so I took a stick and jammed it up so someone couldn't open it. I'm like, you're only visiting us for like three days. I mean, it's like, what's going to happen? But these are really positions where you become the position. They're not jobs. Right? Some of you had jobs. I've had jobs where, you know, you punch in, you do your time, you punch out, and you go home, and you don't think about work. But the men and women who serve in these capacities, and the position I'm in now, my heart goes out. Right? There is no punching in and out. You know, I look at the, the veterans here in front of us, and 
I don't think there's really a retirement. I mean, we got Paul, he's a Marine, and he's hoorah all over the place. I mean, he's, you know. It's hoorah, right? Because there's a hoorah, and then there's a hee-haw, and there's a, I don't know what, <laughs> yahoo. I know woohoo. Oh, uh, I know woohoo. It's a chocolate drink, but, but, you know, but it's, and it's interesting because in the scriptures talk about those who are what they are. The scripture uses that as an example as believers of Christ. As Christians, of those who have given their lives to him. And oftentimes throughout scripture, we have this picture of the soldier linked as an example for us of people who live what they believe. Of those that serve for a higher cause. And in the book of First, uh, Second Timothy, first is, first is well, but First and Second Timothy, Paul, the Apostle Paul, an elder in the church, is writing to this young guy. And in here, he's encouraging them. A young Timothy is, is serving in this church. Uh, and I know what it's like to be a young pastor. I got my first church when I was 28 years old. And, you know, people just look at you. You know, you're just a snotty-nosed punk, you know. I'm not quite so snotty-nosed. Maybe he's a little punk, but I got a few more years under my belt now. And Paul encourages him to hang tough, to be strong, to do what is right. I can't help but this is the message I think some of us who have been around the block would pass on to those who are coming up behind. Be strong. Don't be discouraged. And in the end here, he uses the phrase of being a good soldier. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verse 3 and 4, and this is what we're going to focus on this morning. I won't overdo it this morning because I know you're hungry and you're going to eat after this, so. The second thing is chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good shoulder for Jesus Christ. And no one engages in warfare and entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And this verse is really easy because it just kind of falls into three natural places. So I just want to focus on each one of those and just touch on briefly as Christians of how we're like a soldier and how we can learn. Now, once again, I'm not so sure. Afterwards, feel free to tell me how wrong I am if I'm off base. The first one is you must endure hardship. It's tough. As one who has never experienced war, I, I don't understand, and I, I've been in those positions. To go and fight a fire and crawl into a burning building. To go and serve and to go into a situation where you just don't know what's going to happen. You know, not everyone wants you to show up. <laughs> Not everyone wants the help that is needed, right? It's tough. There's a struggle. Some of you have paid the price that goes along with it. Some of the times it's physical, of wounds and injuries, scars that you've carried on, sometimes psychological. I remember working with a gentleman who just came back from Afghanistan. And we were in Minneapolis, and there, Minneapolis at that point was just starting to have a, a big increase in some Muslim populations. And, and we were uh, working, I worked for Dish Network at the time, and we were installing a system, and a car went by, and there was a backfire in the car. So was, there was a lot of boom. At that same time, uh, two uh, Muslim ladies came around the corner wearing, I don't know if they were quite burqas, but came around the corner, obviously dressed. And he do dove underneath the van. And, and he's like, get down, get down. And, and I looked at him like, what is wrong with you? 
Once again, I'm clueless. And probably about four minutes took him to catch his breath and really come back to, wait a minute, I'm in Minneapolis and not in a war zone. Mental scars that go along the way. We're called to endure hardship. It's not an easy job. And as Christians, we go along as well. And, and in here, being a Christian and a follower of Christ is not easy. I just want, went through and I pulled up two letters. You, I don't know how much you can see. It doesn't come up really good on the screen. But I couldn't help but pull up some letters that were written from the war front. This is the gentleman who was in World War II. Um, he was captured by the Japanese and spent three years in the concentration camps. While he was there, he penned this letter. He was allowed to keep or he hid. He had two photos and he wrote this on the back of the letters and asked that if anything happened, if they would be passed on, that these could make it home to his mom and dad. And over the course of time, these letters made their way gradually, secretly, until they arrived at home. And these are what he wrote. He says, Mom and Dad, it is pretty hard to check out this way without a fighting chance, but we can't live forever. I'm not afraid to die. I just hate the thought of not seeing you again. He says, I'm sending Walt's medals to his mom. He gave them to me September 42. Last time I saw him and Bud, they went to Japan. I guess you can tell Patty that fate just didn't want us to be together. Hold a nice service for me. Uh, put a headstone in the new cemetery. Take care of my nieces and nephews and don't let them ever want for anything. As I and wanting for warmth or water right now. Love your son, Tommy Kennedy. Endure hardship. Second gentleman was out of Vietnam. He started off pounding. He said, I apologize for not writing. He goes, it's hard to write when it's raining hour after hour. The next day the sun broke and he finished off his letter. He says, it got so dark I had to stop last night. Writing like this doesn't really do much good because you aren't here to answer me or discuss things. I guess it helps a little because you are the only one I would say these things to. Maybe sometime I even try to tell you how scared I am right now. Sometimes I wonder how I'll make it. My luck is running good right now. I just hope it lasts. So sorry I haven't written, but the weather is against me. You can't write here when it rains hour after hour. I love you with all my heart. All my love always, Dean. Dean Allen, four days later, stepped on a landmine and never came home. These are the men who gave for us, who endured hardship to win the victory for us. Scripture tells us that we are to endure hardship as Christians, and, and now it's not really popular to stand for Christ, to, to be a religious zealot, and you know we're called bigots, and we're taught haters, and we're told... All these things. I don't know about you, but God tells me I need to love everybody. I need to do good in his name. To take a stand for what is right. We stand for what is right because we're afraid of the consequences. Not for ourselves, but for those that are around us. to stand and take hardship like a good soldier 
And so many people are now are just folding. We're afraid to speak up. We're afraid to do. We're afraid to show. The Bible says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. As Christians, I, I, I believe now it's our time to buck up. Not to withdraw, but to stand. Endure like a good soldier. Because there's much to be done. And I don't know about you, but I think so many things are going in the wrong direction really fast. As a good soldier, endure hardship. Second point, there's three, so I'm almost done. It says, no one engages in warfare and tangles himself in the affairs of this life. When duty calls, you pack up and you go, leaving behind so many things. When the radio goes at night, you leave the warm bed and leave the spouse behind and go off to what duty calls. It's interesting, I, I, I put down camping. I'm not a big camper. You know, how many of you guys enjoy camping? Uh, how many of you guys like, I mean, rough it? I remember at one point, <laughs> I know there's a lot, lot less hands to go up that time. Uh, I remember uh, one time meeting some folks and they said, oh, we're going to go to our camp. And, I, you know, I grew up part of my life up in the county. And camp means maybe a, maybe a wood floor, definitely probably a, a dirt floor, right? Uh, you can see through, there's well ventilated, you can see through the slats in the walls, right? Uh, running water just depends on how fast you carry it, right? You know, a wood stove is a luxury, right? That's, so this person invited us to their camp. Walking in this place, their camp was nicer than our house. <laughs> right? So it's interesting. I, I was like, okay, well, I want a picture of camping. So I, I just really did a quick Google search on, on tenting or something like that. And this website came up. They call it glamping. How many of you guys have heard of that? How many of you guys have done this? Uh, okay, no one. This is their idea of roughing it. This is a camp called, you know, you glamour and camping put together. This is, uh, I'm just curious. How many of you guys' military barracks look like this? No? How many times spend any time in a, in a tent while you're, over, while you're serving? They look like this? <laughs> we entangle ourselves with the affairs of this world, right? Things that trip us up, things that hold us back. We're afraid. And I think as Christians, sometimes we fall into that. Well, if, if I take a stand for Christ, then what will I lose? Because my friends, my Facebook friends and those acquaintances, what will they do? Will they unfriend me? Will they tweet something mean about me? Right? You know, someone's, if someone has a mean tw uh, tweet, does that make them a twit? <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'm not on that. I, I don't know. But we're so afraid of what we have to give up and what we have to lose. Recently, I've come across more pastors who are afraid to say what the Bible says because they're afraid people will leave their church. And we wonder why people, why bother? Right? Either we stand for the truth or we stand for nothing at all. And God hasn't called us necessary to a convenient life. Now, God is blessed, but the danger falls in. Right? For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And if I'm honest, which I have a bad habit of being, I think not only do we have the church, but I think our nation is in danger of losing its soul for the stuff. 
Our families are so consumed with the latest gizmos and gadgets that we lose the family in the midst of it. We lose service. You know, I was interested in ask about volunteers and stuff like that because I've talked to a lot of a different um, first responders. And, and I've asked how, and even military, how are they doing on recruitment? How, and time and time again, what I hear is a lot of young people don't want to commit. Why? Because it's going to cost me too much. I, I'm too entangled in everything that's going on here, right? I mean, as, as a church, we're you know, I, well, I love to come on Sunday, but that's my football day, or that's my this day. We're so entangled in all these other stuff that we really lose focus on what is the important stuff. Because believe it or not, not everything is of equal importance, and you can't do it all. What profit will it gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Paul told Timothy later on in the same book that we're talking about here, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, strong, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I don't know if you have noticed but the dialogue today is a little hostile. Have you noticed that? We've gotten to a point where you're either with us or against us, there's that side and this, and to have common ground anymore is, is a horrible thing. I don't know if you guys know who um, Ellen DeGeneres is. Um, she's a pretty left-wing individual and she got in major trouble because she was at a game with George Bush, who was a conservative, and, and there was a picture of them together in the same box at a sporting event. And once again, everyone exploded. How can you? And she's like, he's my friend. They're like, well, how can you be friends, right? I mean, this is crazy. be so polarized, and we see this happen more and more, the divisions. My wife read me a meme, you know, one of these pictures with little captions on there, and uh, I think it, was, it went something like, I'm preparing not to be with my family at Christmas by discussing politics at, at Thanksgiving, <laughs> right? So if you don't want to see your family for the rest of the holidays, just bring up politics, right? And you'll be kicked out and not and ostracized and, right? We've gotten to this crazy point where we've gone away from basic moralities and common ground. My wife and I have been in Stockton Springs for three and a half years now. And we just have fallen in love with this little community. Because you know what? You guys like each other. Well, most of you. <laughs> but there is a, a sense of community. There is a sense of, you know what? This can pull us together. We can serve together, even though we're different. To build that relationship in the midst of all these things. To give up some of these petty things for the important things. Lastly, the verse ends this way. It's that he may please him who enlisted him. Why do we do what we do? You know, when Uncle Sam called, you do this for Uncle Sam. You do these for those that were home. In the letters I read, those that were willing to sacrifice and give and die, and I had letters upon letters I could have read this morning. Of all those, why did they do it? Why did they sacrifice because they remembered why they were there. They remembered the purpose. Remember the mission. Above everything else. And as Christians, I believe I do what I do because someday I'm going to stand before my maker and give an account for what I did. Life is a precious gift. Don't let anyone tell you any different. 
I get fearful because we want to make it sort of an expendable commodity. Life is precious. Right? This year alone, we've had many members who went on the glory. I've been in a room where one has just passed away and something's different. That those in the room wishes they just had just a little bit more time. Life is precious. Don't waste it. And I know when I stand before the Lord, this is what I want to hear. Jesus said this. He says, And the Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Be done. Be found faithful. I was talking to someone who was going through some things and have you ever have you ever lost does anyone here like losing I don't now I might look sweet and adorable but I'm, I'm a little competitive what are you laughing at <laughs> I'm a competitive person right you know, if I, if I play games with my daughter, I don't let her win. That just is not in my DNA. My oldest, I did the same thing. And my wife would be like, okay, John, have a little mercy. I'm like, no, they suck it up, you know. <laughs> and, you know, we play video games, and I'd just kick her butt, and I felt good about myself. And, uh, well, then the day came, my daughter would beat me. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, hold up, hold up. And, and she's like, suck it up, Dad. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, yeah? I understand being competitive. I understand wanting to win. But over the years, I realized, you know what is more important than winning? Is being faithful. Have you tried your best? Have you gone out there and have you done it all? Or have you held back? Have you been faithful? It's so much more important than being victorious. And in here, to stand before my Lord at the end of it all, and he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. There'll be a time to rest. It just isn't now. I tell the folks here at church all the time, I said, God's not done with you. You know how I know? Because you're still here. God doesn't have a semi-retirement plan. Right? If we're here, we're here for a purpose. We're here for a cause to be faithful to. And some of you maybe are searching out, God, what, what am I here for? You know, things may change. Maybe I can't do what I used to do. All right, but do what you can. You know, I believe the first step is having a relationship with God. God wants to know you. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God wants to have a relationship with you if you open your heart and accept him in. He gives you cause and purpose and a direction. That you too, when you stand before him, you're well done, my good and faithful servant. To be a good soldier. Right? Endure hardship. Learn to, what to let go of. Don't entangle yourself into things that's going to hold you back from doing the purpose. Then ultimately, at the end of it all, to face the one who has called you for all these things. I'm going to close in prayer. We're going to sing a song. Then we'll eat. 
As I mentioned before, we have a lot of our guests here this morning. And so if you're a, a regular attender here, just, I just ask, let, let our guests go first. There's some, it's going to be a little cramped next door. But in here, if you have an opportunity, shake a hand of, the, of someone who stood up front here and th- tell them thank you for what they've done. Let's pray. Our dearly Father, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you for those in this room, Lord, who know what service is like. Lord, use that to inspire us. Lord, to serve our communities, to love those around us, Lord. You, you came to seek and save the lost. Lord, you've called us to be your hands and be your feet. Lord, use us, direct us as good soldiers for you, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. I should please stand the words of this.